Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. So welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're going to be talking with Libby Harrison as part of our Women in Engineering series. And Libby works for Merck as the Associate Director of Client Services. So welcome, Libby. Glad. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're really excited to have you. So glad that you were able to join us today and looking forward to sharing your story with others. And we love to start these episodes with just talking about your personal journey. So what can you tell us there? So I would say my personal journey started off when I was younger. I ended up going to JMU, yay Dukes, um, got a degree in computer information systems. But when I first started my journey, I started at JMU as a marketing major. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I liked marketing, but I wasn't in love with it. So it was one of those situations where I just kind of picked a degree and went in. And I soon realized, I think halfway through my first semester, that marketing probably was not what I wanted to do. There were, I think, 800 people in that degree just in my class. It wasn't really challenging. And so when I kind of realized that, I kind of thought about what did I like to do. And like I said, my journey started when I was really little. I remembered back to some of the funnest times I had was, you know, playing computer games with my mom and my brother and my sister. And um, one of our favorites was King's Quest, if anybody knows that one. And I love to watch my mom just get on the computer and she used to do DOS commands to make things work. And so I figured, hey, like, like, let's give that a try. I think I might be interested in it. And so I soon realized when I got into that, taking some of the classes that I really enjoyed computers. So I started off interning at a essentially an insurance company, was there maybe six months and realized it wasn't going to be challenging enough for me. There was IT work, but not, not enough. And so I headed over to Crutchfield and started doing web programming for them for about two years when I realized, again, it, it just didn't feel like it, it had that challenge that I really wanted or, or purpose. And I was lucky enough at that time to have a position come up at Merck. Uh, I applied, and it was actually for an automation engineer. And so I applied. I ended up getting... And what I realized soon after is that I loved engineering. I loved coding things and watching it work on the line. The first place I worked was actually on a filling line. So you could code something and watch it happen almost automatically. It wasn't like a batch where you had, you know, you kind of had to wait for stuff to happen. So that was my kind of my first introduction to engineering and really loving the, the mix of computers and engineering in one. And so Somehow, I, through that trusted journey, I got to you know where I am today. I, I have moved. I was in automation for twelve, probably eleven years, and then I realized halfway through that I wanted to kind of get back into the computer part of my degree, and so I went over to IT for Merck, and so I kind of support the whole site, but also I have a unique perspective with my job because I have actually done both automation and IT, where sometimes an IT person might not understand the automation side of things or an automation person might not understand the IT. But for me, I've gotten to experience both and that really helps me get a well-rounded view of what's needed for projects and, you know, to kind of think things through. So that's kind of where I am today and, and twisted way of how I got there. So. I love it. That's a great story. I mean, it sounds like, so I heard you say a couple of times, you didn't have enough challenge. So it sounds like you really like to have that challenge in your, in your work. I do. I, I really, you know, along with the challenges, being employed at Merck, it also gives you that purpose. Merck is providing drugs to people, life-saving drugs to people, at, especially for our site, that is, are helping people every day. And so you feel that purpose when you go into work. If something breaks or, you, you're, you know, you're trying to get a project online, you realize that, you're helping at the end of the day, get something to somebody that really needs it. And so along with the challenges of just everything that you face, there's also that sense of purpose that comes with it. So 
That's great. You know, and, and speaking of challenges specific to the pharmaceutical industry, what are some of those that you see maybe coming in the near future? Oh, uh, th- this is easy. Um, as we all know, COVID has hit. And what our site has done is essentially locked down, for the most part, only allowing essential people who really need to be on the line, operating the line, onto the site. We don't want those people to get sick. We want them to be able to help us provide our life-saving medications to people. So what I can see happening now, and, and you can see it kind of coming at full force, is a lot of the workforce is now working from home, where, like, I have a big project I'm working on now where we're trying to take our paper batch records and make them electronic. And there's some things that I need to be able to see on the floor that I can't unless I go to site. And so one of the initiatives that we're seeing happening is there's essentially, I guess, some type of glasses that you can wear that people can, you know, if somebody's on site, they can put them on and walk through an area and you can see the area and you could talk about things with that person and, you know, kind of have a real-time discussion and see what they're looking at on the floor where that person is at ho- really at home watching it through somebody else's lenses. So, you know, that's definitely one of the cha- one of the challenges I see happening in the next year to two years is how can we scale up people working from home and be efficient about it without cutting any of the quality that, that we need from them. So that's, that's one of the greatest challenges I see in the, in the next year to year. Oh, no doubt. Now, so those glasses, so we're, I guess you're not talking augmented reality. You're talking direct line of sight for what they're seeing to person to person? Yeah. So it's essentially, I believe, people wear glasses and, you know, you're, you're able to go out on the floor and look and say, hey, we're, you know, we're talking about this. You can see the scale. Is this what you need? It, you know, it, does it have that model? You know, that model number, is that's what you, you're looking for? Or here we have a problem here. What do we need to do? And, and that, how that works is, you know, it limits the amount of people that have to be in the area that could fa- possibly affect people. And it just, it, it, it really does save people from coming that aren't essentially have to come to the floor to come to the floor and, and expose people to COVID. So, yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's awesome. It sounds like something out of a Marvel movie, you know, it's, it's, it's here though, right? <laughs> You know, the, yep. mm-hmm. it, it, and you're, a lot of stuff you're talking about working from home and trying to figure out this this new world of industry. You know, comes down to you know digital transformation. Just trying to figure out how to to get some of this information, you know, out of the plant in in front of the people that you need to have it. So, you know, hats off to you. You have a, a, a you know a big hurdle in front of you, but I know with people like you, you'll definitely get there. So, uh, it's it's really cool to hear some of the initiatives that you have going right now. So we, we're doing this Women in Engineering series, Libby, and, and we really want to, to tr- inspire and to, to give advice. And for the women that may be listening right now, what would be some advice you would like to share with them about industry? Yeah, so I, I think most of the things I want to share is not necessarily just to, to this in- industry, but just to women in general. One of the th- biggest things for me growing up is I wasn't necessarily as confident as myself as, you know, as I should have been. And as I've gotten older, I've been able to build my confidence and get it to a place where I'm pretty confident in everything I do. I don't necessarily question myself. And I I think that would be one of my takeaways for, for women in the industry. It's just be confident in who you are, never apologize or hide who you are and just show people that you are confident. This is what you know and put it out there and never feel, never feel like you have to hide from that. So that's, you know, one, one big piece of advice I would give people. And, you know, another one was know your worth, know, know how hard you work, what you put into your job and be able to know what you're worth and be able to ask people if you think, you you know, if you're, if you're not being heard on that, you know, there's several times in my career where, I think people didn't understand what my worth was and how much knowledge I had. And people sometimes were amazed when, you know, they found out, oh, you you did that for that many years? I didn't realize that. Sometimes people don't know what you've been through and, you know, experiences in life that you've had. So feel free to let people know, like, hey, I've I've had two years of doing that experience. And, and here's why I know what, you know, what I'm doing. So... And I think my, my last one is, you know, has helped me along the way because I've, you know, I've done some management of people. Where I work now, there is probably upwards of a thousand people on the plant site. And 
there is all different types of personalities to people. And I think, you know, when you start to work with somebody, really pay attention to them, talk to them, get to know them a little bit personally, and figure out how to meet with that person effectively. Um, Because I've had several situations where what works for one person might not work for another. And it, some people are more direct, need a more direct path. Some people need you to, hey, they forget sometimes and they need you to just kind of give them a little simple reminder every once in a while. So, you know, I think it's valuable as, a, as an employee to just really pay attention to people and get to know them and figure out how each person works and how to make your relationship with that person a, a valuable one. So, No doubt. I mean, you, you're, you're all over it. People communicate differently, right? I mean, depending on the, the type of personality type or disc pro, wherever they land on a disc profile, you have to figure out how to communicate with those different individuals. Yeah, I, I've had, I had at least one experience with, with, a, with a guy who he just, his way of thinking was entirely different than mine. He was down in the weeds on a lot of stuff. And, and as I've grown in my job, I realized sometimes you can't necessarily get down in the weeds or you'll get pulled too far down. And so I kind of had to figure him out and figure it out, figure out how his temperament, figure out how he worked. And, you know, once I figured that out, our relationship was great, but it took a little bit of time and effort for me to figure that out. But it was well worth it in the end. Like we had a better relationship. I was able to com- communicate with them more effectively, but it took some effort to do that. So Absolutely. So, I mean, great advice, you know, building those relationships with people, having that confidence. And I love it when you said know your worth. That that is so spot on. And 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 for women in particular, what are some obstacles that that you may face when coming to industry that that others may not? Oh, uh, there there is plenty, but um, I can you know think of several. Um, so I can kind of do this in in two two parts, you know, there, there's the part where a woman first enters the workforce. And then there's of course the part when later on, when they have children, when they're in the workforce. So the first part is like, when you enter the workforce, when I was younger and I entered in, there's not a lot of women, (laughs) of course. Um, and so sometimes as a woman, you might not feel like you should speak up just because you feel a little bit out of place. And sometimes people unconsciously have that bias also that like, oh, she's a woman. Is she really in engineering? Or, you know, was she just, you know, is that her job? Or is she just the administrative assistant? You know, what is she really doing here? And that, and I think that's really, you know, something that you kind of learn along the way. And so I think of my, I have two daughters. I have a one-year-old and a, and a five-year-old. And it's funny, um, both me and my husband work in IT and do, you know, technical jobs. And I never really realized it, but she was talking about something the other day and she said, oh, well, I can't do that. That's for a boy. I'm like, well, why would you say that? You know, like, where did you get that from? And it's not because we tell her and I don't think it's because anybody else has told her. I just think through, you know, TV, media, you know, things like that, that kids, oh, this is what a girl's supposed to do. And this is what a boy's supposed to do. And while they're not right or wrong, that's what they get in their head. And I, I think kind of follows us through middle school, college, and then into your career where you think, oh, I didn't know women were supposed to be doing this. I thought this was more of a man field, you know. So that unconscious bias that you kind of sometimes have but don't realize, I think women, a lot of times women see and, and will be an obstacle for, you know, for you to prove yourself. You're going to always feel like you have to prove yourself a lot more than a man might ha- might not have to. It's been interesting where I've had to carry huge pieces of equipment and, you know, I might be three guys carrying the same thing, but I'm always the one that's asked, oh, can I help you? Can I help you carry that? Um, you will always sometimes feel like people, men have to, they feel like they have to take care of you when you carry heavy things. No, no. Uh, I'm always like, I, I can do it myself unless I really can't. <laughs> So like that, those are some of the obstacles as you get into the field, you know, you're going to start to see that or feel that. So for me, I remember going to, I think it was the Allen Bradley, um, or Rock, Rockwell, uh, fair that they had in, I think it was in Nashville one year. And I was very surprised with the amount of men and there was maybe a hundred women and there was thousands upon thousands of men. And it was very eye opening 
to me to see that. Whereas when I had been in IT, more IT centric, there there were still that more men to women, but it wasn't quite as many when I went to in the engineering field. So that that was a little eye opening and shocking. And then from a standpoint of later in your career for women, what I've found now that I have children is you will always have that you are the caregiver to your child, and you thus you, you tend to put yourself second. Um, whereas if your child needs something like a doctor's appointment or this, that, and the other, you will say, hey, I've got to go do this. And sometimes it may feel like your male coworkers don't do that as much because the women typically take that on. And sometimes that can feel for, at least for myself, I'll start to judge myself like, oh, does anybody think I'm like trying to take time off because, you know, I'm taking my kid to the doctor or things like that. And sometimes that's your own mental person working against you. Um, and I know I've had several friends who were in the IT degree, you know, went to college with me and they all went into the IT field, worked there for a while. And they all had switched jobs to the HR, you know, went to HR for IT. And then eventually they went to being stay at home moms. Um, so I think for women, you know, the obstacles when you get older sometimes is that motherly instincts might pull you to do something different or maybe move out of the field because you need a little bit more flexibility. I'm great. I'm glad that my, my job now has a lot of flexibility, but I know there's some jobs in engineering where you get called at night and that doesn't work for your schedule when you're, you know, taking care of a one year old or, or a six month old. So there's a lot of obstacles for women and, it, and they sometimes progress and are different depending on where you are in your career. Yeah, no doubt. And in, in part of Really, what we're we're hoping is with this podcast, hearing stories like yourself, we're inspiring more and more people. Because you're right, that disparity, it's too one-sided. So, I mean, your comment about the automation fair and the small number of women there, uh, we need to change that. And you said you had a one- and a five-year-old uh, daughters. I have eight- and nine-year-old daughters. Yep. Uh, so, so, so my girls are eight and nine, and I'm so excited for this series – to come out so that they can listen to to people like you and and you know I've had my my nine year old say before too you know about certain things like I'm not sure that I can do that and what my point is is like girl you can do anything anything in the world uh, you, yep. you're not limited and I'm I'm using this platform to share it with them listen to these women and what they've done and what they've accomplished and uh, there are no limits. You know, so uh, hats off to you. I, I know for your two daughters, hopefully this would be something you can play at the appropriate age, you know, later on and, and maybe will will mean something to them as well. So I, thank you so much for walking through those obstacles. They all really spoke to re- to truth. You, you were really speaking truth right there. Yeah. It, when my daughter said, hey, I, I, that's more of a boy thing. It, it's eye opening because you don't realize like the unsettled thing things that are out there that people just don't notice they're like no you you can have that that doesn't have to be a boy thing that you know that doesn't have to be a girl thing you know that can be if you want to play with that or you want to do that you can do it and that's why i'm hoping that yeah with my one and five year old that i can teach them that they can do whatever they want to do it, it doesn't matter if they you know if there's more men in it or more women in it or whatever it would be they can still do it and still you know give their best so absolutely I mean, we, we're, we're a basketball family, and this was our first year we played co-ed, and, and we, we normally play the girls' league, but this year we decided to do a co-ed, and I told I said, look, you can do this. Go hang. And I tell you what, it was they grew as athletes, and, and their confidence just in themselves, like, you know, I can do this. I can hang. And when they steal the ball from them and, and, and go to the other side of court and make a shot, it's just, hey, and those those opportunities, right, just to – I, oh yeah, I love it. I love it, and, and you know there are a lot of myths out there too, uh, Libby, about about women in industry, and I love to give guests like you a chance to, to debunk some of those myths. So if somebody's out there thinking about women in industry, and you you've already mentioned some about you know I can carry this back up off me, <laughs> you know I don't I don't need your help. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, well, are there some other myths you'd like to share? I mean, I th- I think just that women can't do engineering. I, I think when I first started, I was lucky to have, you know, a one, one strong female presence when I first started at Merck and, and she was great to be around, but, and she quickly 
couple months had switched jobs. So it was just me and probably a lot of, a lot of male figures, but it was one of those situations. They had been in the industry for so long that I, you know, I kind of felt timid. I, I kind of felt like I was out of place and, you know, I was unsure. I was unconfident in myself because I felt like I didn't belong. And it was more just because there were, you know, there are men and there was no more women in, in this section that I was, you know, supporting. And it was really something that I wanted, you know, I wanted to show myself, but I wasn't sure how. And, you know, I think, I think it's just, you know, instilling in our young women and, and letting them know, like, you can do this. You're okay. Like, you're fine. You can do just as good as they can. And, and it doesn't matter if you fail. It doesn't, you know, but if you try and you keep working at it, you will be just as good as them. And, you know, the, the guys that I ended up working with at that time ended up being some of the people that had taught me the most about engineering and they were wonderful to work with. And sometimes it was just that mental hurdle for myself of like, just because they've been in the industry for so long and, you know, they're male and, and you're thinking maybe they think I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, that, that probably was somewhat true because I was brand new to the industry, but I was willing to prove myself. And I think once I started getting out there and doing some of that, I felt a lot better and confident with myself. And, you know, I think that's just what we need to, you know, instill in women and young men, whoever goes into these industries that feel confident enough in themselves to just keep working at it and don't be afraid to ask for help if they need it. So. Absolutely. And, and Libby, I'm sure you've had some great mentors and influencers in your career. Anybody you'd like to, to give some recognition to? Oh yes. Um, so I would, there, there's plenty. So I would try not to give too many. Uh, first, um, one of my professors when I was at JMU, uh, Carrie Cole, um, if he ever, ever listens to this, Hey Gary, he, I think he was probably the first person as a teacher and as a, you know, professor to really support me and give me the confidence. Like, he's like, you know what you're doing? Why, why do you feel like you don't know this? You, you know this, you know, he was really a great guy. He, he gave me a lot of confidence in myself. He actually helped me get my first internship. So he was one of, you know, my great in, in, uh, mentors for JMU and helping me get my confidence. And then at Merck, like I said, I had that great female influence when I started. Her name is Penny Dove. She she was amazing. Like she take, took the time to sit down with me being brand new and like teach me. Like I would ask questions. She would always, maybe I was asking stupid questions, but she, you know, she would help me through stuff. She, you know, and if she didn't know the answer, she would find the right person for me. And then, like I was talking about, those those guys, those first guys I worked with when I after she moved out of the area, um, Mike Rodrick, um, Robert Wright, Dan Baxley, those, those guys, they were very senior, at, you know, in their career, but they took the time to teach me stuff. They were like, no, no, I'm not just going to code this for you. You need to code it, and I'll watch you. You know, you need to learn. You know, they were they were very helpful. They were great guys, and and I think that's you know a lot of the reason why I am where I am today is having them there to help me and, and to support me. And even today, if, if I have questions, you know, I might reach out to one of them and be like, Hey, you know, like, this is what I'm thinking. Does that sound right? Oh yeah, you're good. You know, like having them there has always been, has been great. And I, I'm very thankful for, for them. And then probably last me, lastly would just be my boss now, Joe Barton. I mean, he has always supported me in a lot of my career choices, whether it's to move from automation to IT or try something new. You know, he was always there. He, he's always teaching me something. Um, and, and having that in your career, like I've had, you know, I've had a great career from a standpoint of a lot of people have supported me. And so like having those people out there has been great. So like, hats off to all those guys. Now I'm hoping that I can take that and, and give that to some of the younger people that are coming in into the industry, hopefully some, you know, new women, you know, young females getting into the job and, and help them feel confident in themselves. Just by hearing your passion, Libby, you know, you're, you're going to be pouring into people and, and inspiring them and helping them in their careers. No, no doubt about it. So, so excited. And thank you for all those uh, people that you recognized. I think that was great. You know, one, one more question about work, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit outside of work. But from a work standpoint, I really like to talk to people about when are they the happiest? 
when are they in that moment of flow? Uh, so when you're in that and you're getting that fulfillment, what are you doing? So for the most part, what I realize that I love the most, and I sometimes miss when I don't have it that often, is when you work in the industry that I work in now, and I, when I worked in automation, a lot of times you're working with people from all different facets. You might be working with electricians or maintenance guys or operations, technical engineering folks. All these people might be with you working a problem. And, and that's what I really enjoy is having all those people together talking through a problem. And, and not one person is necessarily, you know, talking over the others. It is more of like you're working together to solve that problem. And at the end of the day, it's you all solved it. It wasn't just so-and-so solved it. Um, and, you know, it, it's one of those things that on top of, like, solving that problem, you're solving it to make life-saving drugs. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you're on top of fixing the problem, you know you're fixing it and you're getting something out the door as fast as you can and, and, and making sure that that happens. So I think that's probably my happiest time is being able to work with people and kind of really collaborate and see people with different, folk, you know, different ideas or, or you know, proposals to problems because we all think differently depending on where we're coming from. And so it's been really interesting to see all, you know, if you're working one problem, what all everybody comes up with. So, so I think that's probably my happiest time is when I get to work, work around a lot of people. So no doubt. So that collaboration, but you're also having that collaboration for you in a, in a field of work that brings you a lot of, of self-purpose and, and drive because you, you get that fulfillment because you've mentioned it several times that the life saving drugs that you're, that ultimately what you guys are, are producing. So uh, that that was a wonderful answer. So thank you for walking through that. And I, I'd like to take a chance now, Libby, just to talk a little bit outside of work. Uh, so yeah. maybe share with our listeners some things you like to do uh, for fun. Uh, so this is, some people would say this is not fun. I re- pretty much religiously wake up at, at 4.50 in the morning and work out. And I do that for several reasons. It, it really focuses me um, for my day. It takes time for myself, and it, it also it's a very big de-stressor for me. What I've found, if I don't do it in the mornings, typically I can find myself a little more stressed during the day. So some people would say that would really be a lot of fun, but I find that fun. And right now during COVID, I, I miss a lot of the things, other things that I like to do. I love to travel, and I love to um go see movies. They're, they're probably my two other you know favorite things to do. And right now I can't do too much of that. Yeah. That's kind of, that, that's tough on everybody right now. Now you sit down. I want to make sure I heard it right. 415? Is 450. It? Oh, yeah. 450. Okay. All right. It's still early. <laughs> yeah. So very good. My, my, my one-year-old is up. My one-year-old is up probably before 630 every day. So if I want any time to myself, I got to get up early. <laughs> I got you. So we have a very common thread here, Libby. I, I get up at 415. I, that's why I thought you said that uh, every morning. And that's when I work out because I'm the same way. It's with the eight and nine year old daughters. I need to get it done <laughs> to start the day because if, oh, yeah. if I don't do it early, it's not happening. But I find the same way. It just, it, I, you know, you get that sense of accomplishment first thing in the morning, you know, that you got this done. You get all those those good feelings that just come from working out anyway. So what do you what do you enjoy doing? What what type of workouts are you doing? Well, um, I typically do like boot camp workouts or I run, do like a lot of high intensity cardio lately. Um, I like to lift weights. Those are pretty much probably my, my three things I really like to do. Um, I use, I love to run. I like to put headphones on and just put music on and just, you know, dream away while I run. Um, while as other people are like, how can you do that? I don't know. I, I just can't. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, I, that is probably – I love to run, but it's not something – like, I, I think after I had my, uh, my second daughter, I took a little bit of time off running and did more of a boot camp style um, workout and – I, I love that. It, you know, um, Burn Boot Camp, it, it, we have one in Charlottesville, and I attend that regularly um, when, before COVID. Now I do their online workouts. But, you know, just having that sense of, you know, family, and it's more geared to um, women, you know, getting to meet a lot of women who are kind of like to work out and like the same hobbies, things that you do. So that's an awesome experience to have that community as well. So 
No doubt. I mean, in the, the the your hit training that you're doing, I mean, that stuff's that, that can be a lot of fun. I mean, you can really have a lot of fun at those workouts. Oh yeah. Very cool. So, what about your family? You've mentioned the one and a five year old. So, what, what can you tell us about your the rest of your family? So, my husband and I, he owns well, I own it with him, an IT consulting company here in Charlottesville, and that keeps us busy. I, I'd like to say. Um, he started it two months after we had our first first little girl, Sydney, and I was very much apprehensive, but after we talked it through, I figured, you know, give him the chance to let him do it, and it's been thriving for over five years now. I help him do the books and marketing and all kinds of stuff in, in my spare time, like I have a lot of spare time. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like that that is probably his baby along with our little girls and um you know it, it's it's been fun having girls and ha- you know seeing they're just so loving and caring my my husband wants a third child and he's like I don't want a boy I want another girl so so it, it is one of those things that we do love our girls and I really like I'm so excited to eventually like you said be able to sh- let them hear this and and you know really listen to it I did tell my daughter I was doing it today and she's like, what the podcast? <laughs> so um, we'll have to wait <laughs> probably till she's a little older, but, but yeah, I'm really I, like just being able to um, help them, you know, grow as a person and be able to help them reach their potential, whatever it would be. It, it, it's, it's really exciting. So no doubt it, it, it only gets better. Libby, uh, like I said, my daughter's eight and nine and, I'm with your husband. Uh, there's something about little girls, and uh, they just bring a, a light and a joy, you know, to your life. And it's uh, so. Uh, it sounds like your daughters have uh, some great parents and some role models, and a strong mom, and and it's just really looking forward. To, they have a, a bright future in front of them. So, uh, thank you for sharing so much with us about your your you know life outside of work and your family and we call it eco ask why we love to to kind of summarize and wrap up with the, the final question around the why around the purpose and you've already spoke to it a little bit but you know if you were to have to 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 put an answer to what your personal why is what your what your drive is what would that be i would i would say it changed but now having two daughters is definitely inspiring them to be the best that they can be and, and be proud of their mom. You know, like I want them to grow up and eventually be like, like I was with my mom, like proud to proud of her and, and see what she does. And, you know, say, you know, I want to either do what she does. or I want to do whatever I choose just as good as she does. And then helping people. Like I want to, you know, I definitely, like I said, with Merck, it, it is, it's really nice because I feel like I work every day and there's a purpose and there's a reason why like I go to work and like, I know I'm helping people and it might not be like a doctor or something like that, but it's definitely something like, I still feel like I'm helping people and connecting with them. And, you know, I hear stories all the time about like something Merck does and that has helped people. And that just makes me feel wonderful to have that. So well, thank you so much. That's a wonderful, wonderful why. And and Libby, you you're inspiring others. I, I know uh, the listeners will enjoy this conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Why, why don't you give uh, for the future uh, for your uh, daughters when they get older? Want to give them a little shout out? Hi, babies, and you better be listening to mommy when you're 13 and 14 okay (laughs) that's right you better listen to her because she's she's doing great things so thank you so much Uh, i really appreciate you joining joining us on this series and uh, i wish you nothing but the best in your future career thank you so much for having me thank you for listening to eco ask why this show is supported ad free by electrical equipment company Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.